All right, welcome back. Um, in this video, we are going to talk about how you can make obstacles that will stop your player from moving through them. So in other words, if you want to make some kind of maze or some kind of Pac-Man thing, or maybe you just want obstacles in your world that the player cannot walk through, uh, we're going to talk about how to do that today. Um, so for now, um, before you watch this video, make sure that you have completed the work done in the video where we have a player that can move left or right. So right now, what I have here is I have a player. If I press the A key, they move left. If I let go, they stop moving left. If I press the D key, they move right. If I let go, they stop moving right. So I can kind of move left and right. Um, so make sure you have this. If you have not, if you do not have this, watch the video on making a player move left or right. Cool. So what we want to do is we want to, of course, add some obstacles to this world. But I think even before we do that, it's going to help us do our testing if we can also make the player move up and down, almost like this is some kind of top-down um, view of a game. Um, so let's go ahead and do that. We can do that super quick. Um, if we go to the player class, we can kind of move up through here as well. Um, you will should see... Oops, excuse me. I was doing some prep work. Let me delete all that so we can do it together. Um, so you should see this is the player class that you should have from the end of the previous video. Um, and we have these booleans here that control movement of the player. So what we need to do is if we want it to also move up and down, we need to add booleans for that as well. So boolean is moving up. Boolean is moving down. And of course, whenever you add variables to your class, you need to go to the constructor and also initialize those. Um, I want to, of course, initialize them to be false. So is moving up is false. And then is moving down is false. Cool. Um, then if I go down to my move function, I have these if statements here that check to see if the boolean is true, then move and change the position of the player in that direction. So it's going to look very similar to these, except of course it's going to be with the up and down, which changes the y. So if is moving up is true, we want the y to then like go upwards, of course. So that means we're changing y and we are subtracting because we are moving up. And that is the same as saying y equals itself minus b. These two are the same thing. Um, if we say is moving down, that of course is also moving y. But if you want to move down, you are adding to the y. So that is OK. Cool. So we now we have these if statements here. Um, now we can go over here to our setup and draw tab, go down to the key pressed, and we just need to check to see if some keys are pressed and if they are, move the player up or down. For me, I want the W key to move the player up and the S key to move the player down. So I'm going to add that. Boop, boop. So if key is W, then make is moving up true. And if key is S, make is moving down true. Um, of course, this makes these true when you press the key. We also need to copy these if statements and put them in the key released. But this time we'll say, cool, make those booleans false whenever you release that key. That will make the player stop moving in that direction if you let go of the key. Okay, so we have this here. Um, let's give this a test. Let's see if we have movement in four directions. I can move left, right, up, and down. That's good, which means I can also move diagonally if I want to. So you can see I have very smooth movement. Um, this should look very familiar to the system you did in the collision detection Hello World assignment um, a few months ago. Um, but we now are using a class for this, so it's a bit more organized. Cool. So this is working well. I like it. Um, now what we have to do is we now just need to start adding obstacles to our world. Um, the way we do that is we, of course, make an obstacle class. So I'm going to make a new tab. I'm going to name this tab Obstacle. And the reason I'm naming that Obstacle is because the tab and the class have to have the same name. So this works for us. So I'm going to call this Obstacle. Boop. And I'm going to make my class. So class Obstacle convention is to have a capital letter for the first letter um, of your class. And then we can go and start making this. So every class, of course, needs variables. 
So we have our variables up top. Um, what variables does an obstacle need? Well, I'm thinking an obstacle for now might be a rectangle. So it needs an x position, y position, width, and height. Um, you could also put color in here. Um, I think that's all I need at the moment. Next thing we need is the constructor. Um, the constructor, of course, is a function that tells processing how do you make an individual of this class. In other words, how do you make an individual object of this class? Um, and of course, whenever you make a constructor, the name of that constructor function must be exactly the same as the name of the class. So since our class is named obstacle, this will also be named obstacle. It looks something like this. And of course, the goal of any constructor is to initialize every variable in the class. But we always have to ask ourselves when we do this, do we want to hard set what these variables are so that they're the same for every obstacle when they're made? Or might we want to tweak some of these variables so that they're different for every obstacle that we make? Well, in my mind, every obstacle that we have might be different. So right, might have a different x, y, might have a different width and height. Um, so since these things might be different for every obstacle, we need to have parameters for them. If I wanted to hard code them, I could just put them down here and make it equal to 10 or whatever number I want to. But because I want these to be tweaked for every individual obstacle, I need to have parameters here. So let's go ahead and do that. For my x parameter, I'm going to call that my starting x. Starting y for the y starting w for the width, and starting h for the height. And now we just initialize all of our variables. Well, x is going to be initialized to be starting x. Same thing for all the rest of these as well. So we have our constructor. Uh, let's go ahead and make one function just so we can start doing a little bit of testing here. Um, let's make a function that will display the obstacle on the screen. I'm going to call this render for me. And I'm going to call this, let's see. Uh, what this should do is, of course, for me, it's going to draw a rectangle. So I'm going to use my rect command, rect um, x, y with height. Cool. So let's go, go on over here, back to the set and draw tab. Let's actually make an obstacle. So at the very top, I'm going to make a global variable, which is an obstacle. So it's going to be of type obstacle. I'm going to call it 01, for like obstacle 1. And then initializing my variables, I'm going to say 01 equals. And how do you initialize a object of a class? Well, you have to call the constructor for that class. So 01 is going to be equal to new. You always have the word new. And then our constructor. Now, of course, if I just put this, it freaks out. It does not recognize um, the function obstacle. And that's because if we look at the constructor we just made, it expects four parameters. So we have to make sure when we call this constructor, we also give it these four parameters. So it needs an x, y, width, and height. So how do we do that? Um, well, for me, I think I want my obstacle to have an x of maybe 800 and a y of maybe 600 and then a width of 100, height of 125, or 150, something like that. So it's, it's going to be like a rectangle, right? Now in my draw, if I want to actually display my obstacle, I had to say 01.render, call that render function for it, and that should render on the screen. If we press play, hey, there's the obstacle. There it is just to there on the bottom, which is very good. But then you'll notice if I run into the obstacle, you know, nothing happens. There's no collision. I just move straight on through. Uh, it's not interacting with my player in any way. So what we need to do is we need to, of course, have something to detect collision between the different things here. So let's go ahead and do that. Um, you might remember whenever you've done collision detection in the past, whenever you do collision between two objects, you must make sure that both objects have a hitbox. A hitbox describes and helps processing figure out when two things have collided. So let's actually go inside each of these classes and make some hitbox variables. I'm going to start off with my obstacle. So go into obstacle and I need some hitbox variables. So here we are. Um, I'm going to call these just kind of standard names. So for the left bound, I'm going to call that left. For the right bound, I'm going to call it right. 
top bound top, bottom bound bottom. So we have that here in the obstacle class. Um, of course, they're declared up here, but we need to initialize them in the constructor because, again, the constructor must initialize every variable in the class. So we come on in here. Um, and also note, I'm going to probably be use, using rec mode center here. So in fact, to even make sure of that in my render, I'm going to put rec mode center. And so now if we start thinking about how to initialize these, well, this is actually where a whiteboard might come in handy. So I got a whiteboard here. So we got this little whiteboard here. Um, I'm going to draw, let's say we draw an obstacle. Some kind of, you know, some kind of rectangle type guy. Uh, we know the X and Y is here in the middle. We know that the distance from here to here is described by W, and the distance from here to here is described by H. Cool. So if we want to define the left bound here, how do we do that? Well, if we say the word left, you know, if you're defining the left, you know, if you're moving left or right, the thing that is changing is X, so that means left depends on X. So if you start at the point with an X position of X, which is right here in the middle of the, the obstacle, and you want to go to the left bound, you're of course moving to the left. And how do you make X move to the left? Well, you have to subtract. Well, how much are we subtracting? Well, we are subtracting this much. And that much, how do we you know, define that? Well, that much is just width over two. So that defines the left bound. Uh, let's go ahead and do the right. It's going to be very similar logic. So right, if you think about moving left to right, x is still changing, so it depends on x. But this time, if you're at the center position of our obstacle and moving to the right, well, we're of course moving to the right. How do you do that? Well, you do that by adding something. And the amount we're adding is w divided by 2. Cool. Um, so you probably have now seen the pattern, but we can go ahead and do top and bottom. Uh, the main difference here is that for top and bottom, it's not x that's changing, it is y. So that means they actually depend on y instead of x. But besides that, it's very similar logic. So top is equal to y. If you want to go from the center point to the top, that is going to be subtracting. So we're subtracting, this time not width divided by 2, instead height divided by 2, h divided by 2 because, um, of course, that's the dimension in the y direction. And bottom is going to be the same thing, except if you're moving down, you're actually adding to the y. Cool. So these are our hitbox variables. So let's go ahead and put this in our code. So going back to that, if we come here, where we're in our constructor to initialize these, left is equal to x minus width divided by 2 right is equal to x plus width divided by 2, top is equal to y minus height divided by 2, h divided by 2, and bottom is equal to y plus h divided by 2. Cool, so we now have a hitbox around the obstacle. Now let's go ahead and add a hitbox around the player. Good news is that the player is just a square. Square is just a type of rectangle, right? And so what that means is that the equations for the hitbox equations that the obstacle uses, the player's also going to use. They have identical equations. So what that means is actually really easy. If we just copy the variables we made here, these hitbox variables from obstacle, we can put them inside the player class as well. And then inside the constructor, we can also initialize them. So go into the obstacle class, get um, those initialized hitbox variables, go to the player class, go down to its constructor, and initialize those hitbox variables there as well. So now they both have some hitboxes, which is great. Now I do want to point out one little error that will happen from this though. Um, for example, if I print out in my setup and draw tab, if I print out the left bound of the player, so if I say p1.left, um, then if I press play, you'll see it's printing out the left bound of the player. But as I move the player around, what do you notice about the left bound of the player that's being printed out? Well, it's not changing. And so even though the player um, themselves are moving around on the screen, the hitbox is still in its original spot. Uh, this, of course, is very problematic because, well, if the hitbox is not moving with our player, 
then there's no way we can detect collision because the hitbox is not with it. So what we have to do is we have to make sure that the hitbox of the player updates every time the player moves. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go back to the player class. You see these equations we made um, that update the hitbox um, of the player? Well, all we have to do now is go inside this move function, and I'm going to just copy and paste those um, definitions for the hitbox variables and just put that in the move. This means that whenever you move the player, it's also going to update the hitbox to move with it. So now if I press play and start moving the player around, notice that the left starts off at 575, but if I start moving, it now changes along with the player. So if I put the player where the left bound is close to the left edge, you see it's at about zero. Well, that makes sense because x is zero there. If I go to the other side, and I put the left bound close to the end, it's at almost 1200. Well, if you re remember, 1200 is the width of my window. So everything is kind of checking out here. Now, that's good. They both have hitboxes, but you'll notice that if I like hit my obstacle, nothing changes. Um, that is, of course, because we did not make a collision function. So we have to go ahead and do that. I'm also going to delete this print line here because we don't need it anymore. So to do collision detection between the player class and the obstacle class, you know, what do we do? Well, we need to have a function that does this. But we need that function to have access to the hitbox variables of the obstacle class. But it also needs access to the hitbox variables of the player class. So how do we have it have access to both classes' set of variables? Well, what we need to do is we need to put this function in either the obstacle or the player. Turns out it doesn't matter what. Um, you could do either or. It would be just fine. For me, I think I'm going to put it inside the obstacle class. So I'm going to go inside the obstacle class and make a new function called void mm, collide with player. Or maybe just player collide. Player collide. I kind of like that. Player collide. We have as parentheses, curly brackets, and all that good stuff. So, player collide. Now, because it's in the obstacle class, this player collide function will have access to all the hitbox variables of the obstacle. But it currently does not have access to the hitbox variables of the player class. So how do we give it access? Well, it's actually pretty easy. If we want this to have access to player variables, what we have to do is make sure that it has a parameter, which itself is a player. So this parameter is going to be of type player. I'm going to call this parameter a player. So it sounds very generic, like it could be used for any player. And then notice that we are now good to go. Um, cool. And so now, before writing this code, let's talk about how we will define this collision function. Because this collision function is actually going to be a little bit different um, compared to other collision functions you might have done um, in the past. And the reason for that is, is because this one's going to do something special. It's not going to only detect if um, you're colliding. It's actually going to stop the player from moving through the obstacle. So the way we're going to think about this is that if we have an obstacle, let's say it looks like this. Um, and then we have a little player. And let's say the player is approaching our obstacle from the left side. So there's a player, and there's our obstacle. Um, you, of course, know how to do collision detection just between two things. Like, you know those if statements. Typically, what you do for, you know, more traditional collision detection is you compare, like, the left side of the player with the right side of the obstacle, and the right side of the player with the left side of the obstacle. So they're kind of opposites, right? So you'd compare the top side of the player with the bottom side of the obstacle, and finally, of course, you'd compare the bottom side of the player to the top part of the obstacle. 
That's how you, in the past, have done collision detection. And we're still going to do something very similar to that. But for this, we're not only detecting collision, we're also detecting from which side is the player hitting the obstacle. The reason we care about knowing which side the player is coming from is because if the player is from the left, moving right, then when you hit it, we want the player to stop moving right specifically. Whereas if the player is over here on the right side and they're moving left, then we want to stop the player from moving left, but still allow the player to move right. So, how do we adjust our um, collision if statements to pick up what direction we're moving in? Well, let's kind of talk about that. Let's say the player is coming from the left, and they had now just barely hit. Let me talk about, first of all, what's going to be the same and what's going to be different from traditional collision detection. The only thing that's going to be different is how we check the left side of the player. Since we're approaching from the left side of the obstacle, it's the left side of the player that is different. The rest of it will be the same. So let's go ahead and even kind of like describe the parts that we know will be the same as traditional collision detection. So we know we'll, of course, have an if and we'll kind of check four things. First, we'll check player top, compare that to obstacle bottom, and in this case, the obstacle bottom should be bigger. And I'm going to put this for short for and, but in, in processing, you put the two ampersands. Um, so this is the same as usual. The next line is also the same as usual. That is the player bottom, which is greater than the obstacle top. And, and this third line is also the same as usual. It is going to be the player right compared to the obstacle left. And in this case, the player right should be greater. The only thing that's different is going to be a final thing, the way that we deal with the left side of the player. So the way that you know that the player is coming from the left side is you actually would compare player left to obstacle left. And in this case, if we're coming from the left side, it is going to be obstacle left that is the greater um, dimension here. Because if you look at obstacle left, it is here, and player left is here. But which one is greater? Well, it's the one that's to the right the most, which is going to be obstacle left. And so if you check these four things, this will allow you to check not only are you colliding, but also are you approaching from the left. So let's go actually ahead and implement this if statement into our collide function, and let's make it where the player cannot move into the obstacle if this is true. So let's go ahead and bring up some code. Oop, I already had some stuff from earlier. Ignore that. Um, so let's go ahead and do that. In fact, I even will do this a little bit so we can kind of see our note from the whiteboard. So we know we have an if, and we're going to compare the player top, and it is less than, I'm going to put less than or equal to. Um, it tends to work a little bit better if you have equal to, um, compared to the other, or the obstacle's bottom. And here, if I just type out the word bottom, it knows I mean the bottom bound of the obstacle. The reason it knows that is because we're doing this inside the obstacle class. So if you just say bottom, it knows you mean the obstacle bottom. So if we check this, and if we check a player dot bottom, compare that to the obstacle top, and a player dot right. Compare that to the left of the obstacle. And now the last one is the weird one. That will be a player dot left. If that is less than or equal to the left side of the obstacle. Now, this is our if statement. How do we stop the player from moving inside the obstacle? Well, if this is the case, then what we want to do is we want to stop the player from moving to the right. So the way we do that is we just say, cool, a player dot is moving right equals false. Now, we're going to test this. It's not going to be perfect, but it's going to be pretty close. Uh, let's go ahead and test that if we press play. Got my player, I can move around. Now, if I come from the left side, now what I'm going to do for now is I'm going to let go of the key 
right as I hit, but you'll see I will kind of stop there. So if I go, I, I stop. Now I did kind of get stuck a little bit. So it does kind of get stuck inside by a little bit, but it does stop. Now watch what happens if I hold down my right key, my D key. I don't know if you saw that. It froze for a second and then plowed on through. So you see, it's not working perfectly, right? The reason that's happening is because when it hits, it stops it for that one frame. But if I press the key again, it will move exactly one step before it stops it again. But if I just keep pressing it or keep holding it, it's going to kind of push its way through until it's free. So how do we, pre we prevent that? Well, what we need to do is we need to make it where whenever you collide with the obstacle, we need to snap the player so that the player is at this position. In other words, if I kind of zoom out a little bit, come down over here, if we have our obstacle, we need to make it where if the player goes inside by a little bit, what we need to do is we need to change the situation so we snap the player so that the player is back on the outside like that. So that's what we need to do. So we need to scoot the player back to the left a little bit. Well, the easiest way of doing that would be to say, cool. In fact, let's even go back to the picture. A way of doing that, if we have this, we know that this is the point x, y for the player. We also know that this distance here is width divided by 2 of the player. And so what we can do is we can just say, cool, make, let's we'll scoot that over so we can see, let's make a player dot x equal to the left side of the obstacle minus a player width divided by 2. Oh, a player dot width, there we go, divided by 2. So now check it out. Press play. If I come from the left, and now the player cannot go through. I am holding down the D key right now. And even though I'm holding down the D key, I cannot move inside the obstacle. That's very good. Now, there's still one little problem. And I'm going to press the move left key, which me, for me is the A key. Pressing the A key, and I can't move away. I can move up and down still, and once I get away from the guy, I can move left and right again. So right now, though, he does get stuck. He gets stuck on that obstacle. Um, there's different ways of kind of fixing this. An easy way of doing this would be to say, cool. It's a bit of a hacky way, but it works. Um, don't just snap it to exactly this. Oh, actually, no, no, no. I have an idea. I haven't tested this yet, so we'll see how it goes. The reason this is happening is because when we're checking collision, it counts as being colliding if this is the case, meaning if the right side of the player is exactly hitting the left side of the obstacle, count it. I wonder, and I haven't tested this, I had a different idea earlier, but I want to test this. I wonder if we change this one line to not be equal to, so the right side of the player and the left side of the boundary. I wonder if that works. Let's just check. Yeah, it does. Yep. Now you'll notice if I hold down right, this guy kind of freaks out a little bit. I'm okay with that. For for most games in 103, this is okay. Um, you actually, if you even play a lot of professional games, <laughs> you, you'll see that animations get funny <laughs> when you hit a wall. Um, so I can, I can kind of consider that. So this actually helps. This, so this is nice. Um, but you'll notice if I approach the obstacle from any other direction, I don't stop. So what I have to do is over here, you know how I had one if statement to check to see if I hit from the left side? Well, I need one whole other if statement to check to see if I come from the top, if I come from the right, and come from the bottom. So this is going to be a big function. So let's go ahead and do that. Um, I'm going to I'm going to copy my comment here, but I'm not going to copy the if statement. I think it would just be easier to make it from scratch again. Um, for this one, let's make this next if statement check to see if the player is colliding and coming from the right side. And these if statements will be if 
a player. Since we're coming from the right side, we can draw that out to see what we need to think about in terms of what's special. If we have the obstacle and we have the player, since we're coming from the right, we need to compare the right side of the player to the right side of the obstacle. So that's kind of the special case. So for top bottom of the player and left of the player, that's normal. So if f a player dot top is less than or equal to the bottom of the obstacle, and if a player dot bottom is greater than or equal to the top of the obstacle, and if a player dot left is less than or equal to the right of the obstacle, and and this is the weird one. A player dot right if that is greater than or equal to the right side of the obstacle. Now earlier, um, remember how I made this this one condition not equal to. Um, I got that from this part right here. So this would be the left side of the player and right side of the obstacle. So that would be left side of the player, right side of the obstacle. So this one. So let's go ahead and preemptively do that. And what we want to do, of course, is we want to say, cool, if this happens, then a player dot is moving left is equal to false. What we can also do is we can snap the player to the proper position. And that's going to be the right side of the obstacle plus a player dot width divided by 2. So let's give that a test. If I come from the left, we're good. If I come from the right, we are now also good. So that's great. But if I come from the top, whoo, notice it gets kind of weird. Yeah, so I can either go through, or sometimes if I kind of hit the edge, the corner, I kind of roll over, which is actually kind of nice. But we definitely don't want this to happen. It's not a tunnel. <laughs> okay, so we need if statements for that. Um, so I'm going to say, cool, come on down here. Oop, let's copy this comment. This comment, though, is going to be the same thing, but check to see if we're coming from the top. And I like to draw that out really quick, so let's move this on over. If we have our obstacle and our player is coming from the top, it looks like this. What's the special thing we're comparing? Well, we have to compare the top of the player with the top of the obstacle. Um, so that's the special thing. rest of these are normal. So, if a player dot left is less than or equal to the right of the obstacle, and a player dot right is greater than or equal to the left of the obstacle, and a player dot bottom is greater than, not greater than or equal to in this case, just greater than, is greater than the top of the obstacle. Then, and here's the weird one, a player dot top will be less than or equal to the top of the obstacle. And if that is the case, well, what's happening is the player is moving down. So we want to say a player dot is moving down equals false. Finally, we want to then say, cool, a player dot y is equal to the top of the obstacle minus a player dot h divided by 2. That will snap the player back to the position. Let's give that a test. If I come from the left, we're good. If I come from the right, we're good. If we come from the top, also good. We cannot go through, which is good. So one more. Let's go ahead and do the bottom. Um, so let's go ahead, copy that, boop, boop, paste that, let's check to see if we're coming from the bottom, and again, I like to draw that out, so that's going to be like if we have an obstacle here, and our player is coming from the bottom, so in this case, since we're coming from the bottom, we're going to compare the bottom of the player to the bottom of the obstacle, and then we'll go from there. So the rest of these are normal um, collision detection stuff. So if a player dot left less than or equal to the right of the obstacle and a player dot right 
greater than or equal to the left of the obstacle. A player dot top is less than or equal to the bottom of the obstacle. And finally, oh, and we don't want it equal to on that one. And a player dot bottom is greater than or equal to the bottom of the obstacle. If that is the case, we want to stop the player from moving in that direction. So if you come from the bottom, that means you're moving up. So a player dot is moving up is false. And then what we want to do is say a player dot y is equal to the bottom of the obstacle uh, plus a player dot h divided by 2. So let's give this a test. Come from the left, come from the top, come from the right, come from the bottom, and we're good. Even if we come from a corner, notice that it handles that as well. So we can eh, eh, eh. So that works. And so, cool. Now, this is a very complicated thing. Um, hopefully that you were able to follow along. It's a very weird type of thing, um, but this is how you can do that. Cool. Now, there's one last thing I want to talk about in this, this long video, <laughs> which is um, how do you have multiple um, obstacles? Because right now I have one. What's cool is once you make these functions here, once you have this collision function in your obstacle class, we can make that work for any amount of obstacles no matter how many you have. Um, you can make a Pac-Man maze with 100 obstacles and this will all work. Um, how do you do that? Well, let's talk about it. First of all, what I want to do is just go ahead and make um, a second obstacle, obstacle O2. And I'm going to initialize that in my setup, so O2 is equal to a new obstacle. In this case, I'm going to make this one have an x of maybe 200, a y of also 200, and then a width of 300, and a height of 50. Make it like a weird size. Now, what I could do, of course, I can come down here and I could say o2.render, o2.playerCollide, so on and so forth. Um, but of course, if you have a hundred different things, that's going to get annoying, right? That's a lot of copying and pasting. It's no good. So how do we handle doing stuff with a lot of obstacles? Well, hopefully you guessed it. It is an array list. So that's why we have array list, right? So I'm going to come up here to my set of a draw tab at the top and make a global variable, which is an array list to hold obstacles. The way I do that is I say array list less than symbol. And then what type of thing does this hold? Well, it holds obstacles. So we say obstacle. Um, and I'm going to call this obstacle list. So there we go. We have declared our array list. Now we need to initialize that. So down here in my setup, I'm going to say obstacle list is equal to a new array list. And if you don't remember the syntax, just review the lecture on array list. Um, but the type of thing this holds is obstacles. And of course, we have parentheses as well because what we're doing is calling the constructor for array list. Now, once we have this, all we have to do is we just say obstacle list dot add o1. And while we're here, we'll go ahead and add o2. And there we go. So this will allow us to add these to our list. And so down here, instead of saying o1 dot render o1 dot player collide, we can make a for loop to go through everything inside obstacle list. So a little comment there, everything in obstacle list. And again, if you don't remember this syntax, just review the lecture on array list, but it's going to be four. And then the thing we give it is a local variable, which represents a thing in the array list. Well, what type of thing is in the array list? It, well, it is an obstacle. And I'm going to call this thing an obstacle. So it sounds very general, right? So for an obstacle, in um, obstacle list, the way you say in obstacle list is colon, so in obstacle list. So then what do we do? Well, we just say an obstacle dot render, and then we say an obstacle dot player collide. And of course, that takes in P1 as the parameter. So now if I press play, now I have two obstacles, and if I come on through, 
Oh, can't move through that one. Can't move through that one. Can't move through that side. Can't move through that side. Let's test the new other one. Oh, can't move through there. Oh, I made it so skinny <laughs> that I snap. That's okay, though. I can fix that here in a second. Eh. But you see, I cannot go through this obstacle no matter how, how hard I try, um, which is very good. And so now I could add as many obstacles to this as I wanted to, um, and it would work. So you can make a maze, you can make little you know, little things you hide behind, or anything like that. Um, so yeah, so that's how you actually <laughs> get designed obstacles to block player movement. Hopefully that was helpful.